I was a freelance writer who got tired of writing scripts about nothing at all, and I began reading science fiction. And among the science fiction I read was the David the Swifts about the Lilliputians. And I began to see from that you could write about something in science fiction. And so I dreamed up the Star Trek idea so that I could comment on man and society. They didn't want to have anything to do with it. I, they thought that uh, I, I made it too complicated. They felt I had offered them a wagon train to the stars, which I had, because I wanted to sell it. And Westerns were very big at the time. And uh, they felt that I'd double-crossed them. I'd read them this, written them this thing about uh, uh, where the mind went in, in certain ways, and they wanted someone with bare knuckles and a fist fight. They turned it down, and, uh, but they did like some parts of it. They, the first time they said they'd ever felt like they were truly in a spaceship. And they turned it down, they said, now if you will really give us uh, uh, the equivalent of a Western, uh, we, can, we can put you back to work on it. So we made them a second show, which had uh, a lot of science fiction elements too, but at least it ended up with uh, uh, Bill Shatner in a bare-knuckle fist fight in which he beats a godlike figure in, in, in a fair brawl. And I, I thought it was a terrible idea, but it, but it worked and it met their needs, and that started us. We sold Star Trek with it. Jeffrey was a good actor, and uh, it was good to have him on the show. However, uh, he kind of, his wife kind of felt that science fiction was a little beneath him. And so they didn't want to go on to a second pilot. Bill Shatner then came available, Thank God, because Bill did a marvelous job, as, as we know from uh, 20 years of reruns. And uh, uh, with it behind him, we put the series together. It was both. It was, it was sort of a, a little fakery on my part, too, because Westerns were exciting then, and, and they could understand Wagon Train, whereas they, very few people in those days read science fiction and almost no network executives or studio heads. And, uh, uh, you know, they, they thought in terms of Buck Rogers and of uh, naked girls in, in silver breastplates and uh, uh, nothing about the, what the heart of real science fiction is, stories about people and ideas. And uh, so I, I had to fake a little bit to, to get them to watch it. Well, I had enough up and down, so when I came back to Paramount and we started talking about a, a second run of Star Trek, which became the next generation, I, I said I wasn't interested. I, I just, uh, in all of those years of doing 78 Star Trek episodes, the emotional cost was to me was too much. I was being censored because uh, they claimed we had open mouth kisses and uh, uh, they were measuring uh, we had a whole show thrown off the air because a naval, ladies' naval, was seen in it. And uh, although the next year the networks came out with Laugh In, and uh, belly buttons were wild then, uh, it's a, it's a ridiculous way to for a writer to lead his life to have uh, to have uh, uh, junior executives who don't know writing and don't know science fiction uh, telling you you cannot do this or you must do this. I'm an artist, basically. Uh, that's what artists have done since time immemorial. That's why you've always had artists, even with cavemen and so on. It is, it is a basic and necessary function for humanities. Artists explain everything that we see and explain why it's important. And uh, uh, artist is not, art is not a thing of deft, beautiful, writings or sculpturing of music, it's a, it's a thing of comment. I had always been a fan, speaking of Westerns, of Gunsmoke, and with their cast of Kitty and Doc and Chester and so on, and I, I noticed how well that worked over uh, episode after episode. And uh, uh, I thought, if I ever do a series I want to do the same type of thing where the characters are like Uncle Joe drops by and there's Dad and there's Brave Brother and so on. And so I really cast my Star Trek people as a television family. And you knew what their secrets were 
and you would laugh at the same joke every week, as you do in, in real life. Captain Kirk is Captain Hornblower of the, of, uh, the sailing ships, who was a great hero, and Hemingway said is the uh, most exciting uh, uh, adventure fiction in the human language. Myself, I had screwed up so many times in life through emotions, I thought, wouldn't it be fun to write someone who is totally emotional, motionless and logical? Chekhov came on the show because I'd read something and uh, someone had sent me a copy of a Russian newspaper in which they said after our first year, oh, the ugly Americans are at it again. We were the first people in space, and then, but the Americans don't even have a Russian aboard this crew. So I wrote the Russian aboard the crew and wrote a, sent a copy of it to the communist youth newspaper, which they never answered. When I was trying to find a name for Nichelle Nichols, uh, and thought of the Swahili for freedom, which is Uhura, Uhuru, and decided to make, feminize it, make it Uhura. I, I knew I could hear her shriek of joy from across town. Uh, I, I was pleased that uh, in those days, when uh, you couldn't get even blacks on television, that I not only had a black, but a black woman and a black officer. And that'll show them. Great affection I have for Asians and what they do and the important part they play in the world. And I just, I just could not have a, a group of Earth people without including that great, you know, one half or more of, of the Earth continents. Uh, Scots have always been shipbuilders and ship engineers and so on. And that was a bow to true tradition and uh, of great fun bow to because it speaks to some basic human needs that uh, uh, there is a tomorrow. It's not all going to be over with a big flash and a bomb. Uh, that the human race is improving. Uh, that uh, we have things to be proud of as humans. No, astronauts, uh, ancient astronauts did not build the pyramids. Human beings built them because they're clever and they work hard. And Star Trek is about those things. I feel that mo my principal love is writing words, language. Probably if I had started directing early, I would have enjoyed it very much because certainly the director, particularly in motion pictures, is the man in charge of a production, which is sort of the reason I uh, decided to, after producing the first Star Trek movie, I decided to go back to television because in television, the, the writer-producer is the man. and. Uh, uh, I was more interested in getting my ideas over than I was in making a, um, a movie that looked good. Well, I'm very close to the people at NASA and, and places like that, as at MIC and, uh, MIT and so on. And uh, I learn a lot from them, and they call me with ideas. As a matter of fact, one of the advanced planners of NASA is arriving in town today, and I'll be having some meetings with him next week. They've been very helpful. I was very afraid when I started Star Trek that scientists and, and NASA people would say, oh, God, you're so inaccurate and you're so wrong. And, and uh, I, I almost hated to deal with them at first until I discovered that they're not like that. They're intelligent, and because they're intelligent, they understand the problems of show business. And they understand that I had to appeal to a mass audience as well as a specialized audience. And it's been, a, it's been a love feast. Someone asked me some years ago before I'd ever gotten any kind of a check for Star Trek reruns, uh, what is your profit on the series? And I said, the, the greatest profit of all, the, the, the people that I could not pay to meet and know, Isaac Asimov and, and uh, Arthur C. Clarke and the NASA people and the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab where I'm welcome. Uh, Wow, you can't buy that. Far too many people believed, and many still believe, that they're a bunch of teenagers who wear odd clothing and, and give odd signs and things, but they're not. Uh, uh, trekkers uh, include businessmen, uh, bank presidents, stockbrokers, uh, college professors, and, and a large number of astronauts, of whom I saw a couple two nights ago who were out here uh, 
it, no, Trekker, Trekkers are really, it also includes the kids and God bless them and let them have fun. But it's people who sort of believe in the general type of thing we're talking about in Star Trek, that the human species is to be admired and it is really going to go somewhere. Well, the fans were wild for the idea and I kind of liked the idea too. I was broke. Uh, the uh, people were not exactly standing in line to hire the guy. I, w I was a much sought after freelance writer until I did Star Trek. Then the story got around town that I had uh, uh, done this crazy series that practically broke the studio from its costs and all that sort of thing. And and uh, uh, I, I couldn't I couldn't get uh, much work. I figured from the movie, maybe I could get involved to the point of making some money, which my wife and I desperately needed to pay our mortgage and so on. And so I guess I was encouraged by greed as much as by a chance to see what Star Trek could do on the big screen and with, with an adequate budget and so on. And I'm, I'm glad we went along that way. And when I didn't want to produce him, Harv Bennett came along and he did a very good job. He was a very experienced uh, producer and, uh, and I was delighted to leave that in his hands with myself remaining, keeping the consulting function. First uh, Star Trek series, uh, we treated such things as uh, uh, mixed races aboard the spaceship and uh, uh, whether women could be in charge of anything and so on. And when we shocked the audience uh, by saying yes to those questions. In the new series, with new characters and new attitudes, we, we have a chance to deal with still more important questions and questions of the 80s and the 90s, such as the question of terrorists. Uh, the question of next, last year we did, we touched on the question of, of drugs. Why do people take drugs? Because they're bad? Uh, obviously there's more to it than that. Uh, I want to touch on the, the problems of superstitions which rule the world and set people bombing each other. I respect them. There, there are all sorts of trekkers. Uh, from teenagers to to businessmen to professionals, and uh, uh, they're, they're people who want the s largely they want the same sort of things out of humanity that I want. And uh, it's strange to go to a meeting of people who are some some of whom are wearing strange clothes and making strange signs and so on, and and find out that uh, they're very serious and uh, and they they care deeply about who and what this creature human is. Well, they kept it alive through their clubs and their, their uh, various meetings and so on, and for which, uh, but they kept it alive because they, they enjoyed doing these things. They enjoy their conventions, just as much as uh, veterans enjoy their, their conventions. Uh, I don't let, I've never let Trekkers though run Star Trek, because Star Trek is a, and an artistic endeavor that is best run by the professionals then. I will listen to trekkers and trekkies. I will listen to the guard at the gate uh, and, and get many good ideas uh, those ways. But uh, no, I, I will never make a change in Star Trek because I think it will please the trekkers. Uh, in that way lies prostitution. And you cannot be a a good producer, writer, or anything, if, if, if you, if you, first thing you ask is, what do they want? That's what prostitutes do. I write what I think they should have and what I think they'll enjoy. And thank God I've been right occasionally. Because it says it's not all over, it's not all, we're not going to go up and smoke, we're going to make it. Because it says the human adventure has just begun. That's it in a nutshell. I would hope there are bright young people growing up all the time uh, who will bring to it levels and areas that, uh, that were beyond me. And uh, I, I don't feel jealous about that at all. I think that, uh, as I was saying, Hollywood, the motion picture industry is a remarkable thing. And it'll, it'll go on with, uh, without any of us and get better and better and better because that's the, that really is the human condition is to improve and improve. Get lost, you know. 
to go go through the things I went through with with network executives and so on to do it all over again. Uh, on the first show and on the original Star Trek, I I practically lost my family from working so many 12-hour days, 14-hour days, seven days a week. And I said, uh, you can't pay me enough to, to do that. But then they said, hey, but suppose we did it in a way in which they, they call syndication, in which we don't have a network, and we don't have all those people. And Paramount was saying to me, and we guarantee to you that you will be in charge of the show. Who, I asked, who would be the censor? They said, you. You've been around television long enough to know what doesn't play and what can't. And, uh, and very slowly I began to be... Oh, and then it occurred to me that we couldn't possibly do it with the old cast. The old cast was doing movies. You couldn't afford them in the first place. Nor could you do it with the old cast because the crew people you have who, who need encouragement, who need to have their thing, People don't just work for money. Uh, the mixers, the cameramen, and all of those people have to have their show. And with a new cast, it could be that way. Uh, it could be have new ideas and so on. Uh, people, the whole group could say, as they say today, it's our Star Trek. And you desperately need that. After doing all of those episodes, is, is there, are there new things you can do? My God, yes. Uh, the, the basis of our series is the galaxy, and there's quite a few stories out there. I decided that we can't have people smoking. Although I smoked in those days, the networks advertised cigarettes. Uh, I said, man, we'll, we'll just be too smart to keep this up. So I said, no one smokes, which caused lots, lots of problems. Uh, I feel the same thing about drinking today, and I hasten to say I drink and enjoy it. Uh, we're too smart to continue that for long, and we have invented for the bar room something called synthanol, which acts just the same as alcohol, makes you feel that you can be a lover or wise or all the things that alcohol does, but with uh, but uh, it's only temporary. Uh, you, you, with a force of will, you can shove it aside and you're as sober as you ever were. So our ship will have synthanol. No, it makes me nervous because it isn't good enough what we did, and we've got to now build on that and make it better. Uh, once you begin sticking your tongue out, literally or figuratively, at people, uh, your brain goes too, and uh, you end up with a, a show that uh, is crap. And I want Star Trek to be uh, do the things it can do. I've never felt that I had it made. What we can expect in the future is uh, to continue to explore the human creature and what our, what our problems is and the things I talked about, the, the place superstition is plan and, and destroying harmony between nations and so on. Uh, also, I'd like to get into a little bit into the absurdities of 20th century politics, which we can look back on from the 24th century. And, uh, and we'll, we'll consider the 20th century something that we had to go through, but our people will see it as something they're glad to be rid of, you know. Paramount uh, said, we will back you in this, and by God, they did. And I've had nothing but uh, good treatment out of them. I, I do feel sometimes they were nervous about giving the keys to the asylum to a writer, but uh, despite their nervousness, they stood true to their word, and I, I really respect them and thank them. There's a guy who knows something about what Star Trek should be, but doesn't know at all, and uh, I see it as a... I see Star Trek as part of the continuing education of Gene Roddenberry. I, I learn new things every day about science and humanity and history. They're paying me to go to college and paying me very richly, and I thank them. <laughs>